Welcome to week four of our Advent study titled God Broke Through at Christmas. I'm going to begin by sharing our um, <clears throat> PowerPoint with you. This is an Advent study that it is an Advent study that is based on the book by Bishop Wallace Pageant titled God Broke Through at Christmas. And we, as I said, we are on week three. Um, my name is Brooke Hartman. I'm pastor of discipleship at Concord United Methodist Church in Knoxville, Tennessee. If you are joining us from somewhere other than here in the Knoxville area, we welcome you. I welcome you if you're from Knoxville as well. If you want to contact me for any reason, my email address is bhartman at concordunited.org. Our study um, as I've said, this is week four. I encourage you, if you've not studied or watched the videos on week one, two, and three, to do that because this continues to build. Let's begin in prayer. Oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer, we thank you. We thank you for this study. We thank you for this time. We thank you for your word. We thank you that you broke through at Christmas in so many ways through coming to be with us through Jesus Christ. Lord, we give you this time in your holy name. Amen. Uh, I, I've shared this each each week, this uh, this quote by Dietrich Bonhoeffer uh, from his uh, from a devote Advent devotional called God is in the Manger. And it's who among us will create, celebrate Christmas correctly. Whoever finally lays down all power, all honor, all reputation, all vanity, all arrogance, all individualism beside the manger. Whoa, that's a lot. Whoever remains lowly and lets God alone be God. Whoever looks at the child in the manger and sees the glory of God precisely in his lowliness. Something for us to ponder. The, the study has um, four weeks, as I've said. The first week was God broke through at Christmas. God broke through the silence with the word. We talked about that 400 years between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And we focused on the John 1 the first few verses and verse 14. We then went to God broke through the night with light. And we focused on the, the verse in John 1 that talks about the Jesus is the light and the darkness cannot overcome it. Last week, week three, we talked about the miracle of when Gabriel came to Mary, not only was it the miracle of incarnation, so the impossible with a miracle, God breaks through the impossible with a miracle, but also how Mary's response was miraculous. I'm your servant. Um, your will be done. And, um, and this week we talk about God broke through at Christmas, broke through the chaos with the peace. I want you to pause the video and I want you to think about what is the definition of chaos for you? What are, what are some examples? We, some, some examples that, that chaos can be, it could be as um, simple as uh, traffic. It could be um, politics, maybe not quite so simple. It could be our families. It could be our jobs. It could be an illness. There's so many things in our lives that create this chaos, this upside downness to our lives. And those are just a couple of examples that may be true for you. I have prayer in here twice. We must need to pray a lot. Um, and then we define peace. And we think of peace, if, if chaos is disorder, then peace is order. If chaos is upside down, then peace would be right side up. And examples of peace, interestingly enough, is almost more difficult to come up with an examples of chaos because it seems like we're around chaos a lot more than peace, maybe. Something to think about. When we think of the chaos that the Israelites dealt with in eighth century BC, the Assyrian, Assyrian exile created a need for the relocation of the Israelites and others came into the area where they lived. It was chaotic. In the sixth century, the Babylonian conquest of the southern kingdom created chaos. And then there was a Persian conquest of the Babylonians. The Israelites were able to return home, yet they were still ruled by a foreign power. It was chaotic. They wanted it to be the way it was. Isn't that something we can relate to? 
We want it the way it was. We want it back to the good old days, or at least pre-pandemic. And then there was a continued domination of other foreign powers. And in some of these, um, these foreign powers that we've talked about in previous weeks, the, the powers allowed the Israelites to continue to have and, and practice their traditions, and then some didn't. In fact, some were counter to um, Jewish traditions, such as desecration of the temple. Yet in the midst of it was this chaos and this waiting and this hoping um, for their Messiah, for our Messiah. When we talk about the all exam examples of chaos in our own lives, um, take a minute to ponder that. The ways that the Israelites coped were they longed to go home, have the life that they had known. Does that sound familiar? After decades, they realized they were never going to happen and if, even if they were allowed to return and there was this concept of acceptance, which is, which is a hard concept because in our acceptance of a situation or a chaos, we seem to believe that means we are giving permission for the chaos. We're letting the opposing, whatever is creating chaos, that we're allowing it to win. It requires us to surrender, surrender. And I don't know about y'all, but I'm not, that's, that's not what comes naturally to me. Jeremiah talked about the concept that is you bloom where, where, where you're planted, that no matter where we are, no matter what we're doing, this is where we are. And then there was revolt. There were these different ways that the Israelites coped with the chaos that they experienced in those days, months, years, generations leading up to God breaking through at Christmas. We too long for the normal. We, we have the varying ways that we cope. One of the major ways that we cope, it was we try to gain more and more control. And it seems to be counter to what is needed. And this is how do we attempt to handle chaos in our own lives? There's these types of peace that Bishop Law's pageant talks about. There's the inner peace that transform in a contrast from other types. There's this peace of Rome. It was this forced peace that required military intervention, and it was surface peace. It looked like peace, though it really wasn't peace, and we too fall into that where we're in this forced peace. I am peaceful. I'm not peaceful. I want to be, but yet then there's this other shalom, this, the Hebrew word that is given as a blessing upon meeting and leaving, but it means wholeness at many levels, peace between groups or countries. The source of shalom is the triune God, is the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And in the midst of our own chaos, that's what we desire more than anything. We often think that peace is based on circumstances, that if, if the pandemic will just be over with, if I can just go back to my life, if my loved one was just still alive, if this, if I just had the job, if this, if my son or daughter would just do this, if my husband or son would just do this, if my mom or dad would just do, all these things that we look at is circumstantial. If they would only come true, then I'd have peace. Yet what we know time and time again in our lives is that circumstantial peace is fleeting at best and seldom do, do circumstances work out the way we think they ought to, though we will them and we attempt to control them. Yet we desire this wholeness, this peace that passes all understanding. The peace on earth in Luke 2, 14 is shalom. It is in the midst of the story of the angels coming to the shepherds to tell them the good news of Jesus, of the baby born in the manger. And they say, peace on earth, shalom, wholeness. That's what we want. That's how God breaks through at Christmas. That's how God breaks through the chaos with peace. It's a peace of shalom, of wholeness that the world cannot give us, but God can give us in the midst of and despite of our circumstances. You see, this peace isn't just for the shepherds. It's just not a peace of a long time ago or just in the Bible. It's a peace for us. How would we seek this peace? How do we get this peace? It's 
going to have to be intentional and focus not outwardly, but inwardly. Focus on God's word, on, on following Jesus. That's the peace that passes all understanding. That is the core story that Bishop Wallace Pageant talks about in uh, week four, is the story of the shepherds and the peace that comes in the midst of the chaos. Yet Bishop, pa Bishop Wallace Pageant goes on to talk about other ways that we see peace. In Galatians 5, 22 through 26, we see uh, we, the fruit of the Spirit is outlined in that. And the fruit of the Spirit includes love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. What about that? Take a look at that list. When you think about ourselves, each and every one of us, and we look at that list and we go, okay, how, how do I demonstrate love? Like unconditional love. What about joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control? Yet what is key about this passage is it is fruit of the spirit. We are incapable of doing this just because we're good people. That's fleeting. If we do it, it's fleeting. It's not some moral standard that we're living up to. It is a fruit. It is fruit of the spirit, of the Holy Spirit. And that, that is important for us to, co to comprehend and to ponder and to consider. If we're lacking in these areas, then it goes back to our connection with the Holy Spirit, with God. And peace is one of these. When people are around us, is it peaceful? Or are we chaotic? Do we create chaos? Where do we find ourselves in relationship to the fruit of the Spirit? particularly with peace. In Philippians 4, 6 through 7, Bishop Wallace Pageant talks about the inexplicable peace. And it's the, the scripture um, when Paul's writing to the church at Philippi. And it's the one. Now, like, just listen to this. Do not worry about anything. Pause and think about what have you worried about today? Just today, what have you worried about? Paul says, don't worry about anything. But in everything by prayer and supplication, and supplication is asking, but everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. Peace, not worrying. Put in everything, um, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving to God, to offering up to God what it is that we need, that we desire. Ask, ask God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus, in Jesus Christ. The peace of God, not the peace of the world, not the peace of things going the way I think they ought to, but the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. And what will that peace do? I'll guard our hearts. I'll guard our minds in Jesus Christ. The world can't give this to us. The peace of the world is fleeting. Chaos is part of existing in this world, but yet there is a peace of God, the peace of God that surpasses all understanding, and it's going to guard us. It does guard us. It guards our hearts and our minds in Jesus Christ. Powerful. Think about that. Pray about that. Lift that out. What would happen if we lived in this text every day. Read it in the morning, read it in the noontime, read it in the evening, read it at bedtime. Lord, I want the peace that passes all understanding. This is what I'm worried about. John 16, 33, Bishop Wallace Pageant shares with us that that's the long view. It's that the world 
Where does our peace come from? Does our peace come from the world? And what are the characteristics of peace that comes from the world? You think about peace treaties that are signed. It's this it's humans working to work out peace. And sometimes it stays and sometimes it doesn't. Yet the peace in Jesus, what are the characteristics of peace that comes from Jesus? Peace that passes all understanding. The peace that sits by our loved one's bedside as they are suffering. Peace that sits around the funeral home table as we plan the final arrangements. The peace that comforts a mom and or a dad as they watch their loved one, their son or daughter, spin out of control in addictions to chemicals and addictions to success as we, as our, our uh, relationships, our marriages are strained. We want a peace that comes from Jesus, a peace that we can't brokerage out of ourselves. It's a peace that comes from the baby born in the manger, the baby who is God coming to be with us through Jesus Christ, who will dwell among us, who did dwell among us. Matthew 5, Matthew 5, 6, and 7 are the Sermon on the Mount. And it begins in Matthew 5 with what we call the Beatitudes. It's that part where it tells us, blessed are those who, and in Matthew 5, 9, it talks about, blessed are those who are the peacemakers. It just makes me wonder. It doesn't say, blessed are those who force their will upon others. It's about peace. And Jesus taught that. He was teaching his disciples what like core beliefs. And that's us too. Spend time. If you've not spent time in Matthew 5, 6, and 7 recently or ever, I highly recommend it. It's life-changing. It's life-challenging. It's life-transformational. It is not of this world. It will require us to depend on a God greater than ourselves. Bishop Wallace's pageant concludes her Advent study on Christmas Eve with Luke 2, 21 through 40. And the title of that one is God Broke Through the Hopelessness with Hope. It's the story of Simeon and Anna, of how Mary and Joseph, after um, Jesus was born, on the eighth day, they completed these these items, not just on the eighth day, but on the eighth day, they go to the temple and they complete these Jewish traditions, such as circumcision. They went to Jerusalem. They named Jesus. And if you're interested, if you go to Luke 1 and you see where Elizabeth and Zachariah um, present uh, John, there, there is similar language in John 1 and John 1, Luke 1 and Luke 2 that parallel Jesus and jo John's stories. But also what happens um, in the Luke 2 is we meet two folks. We meet Simeon and we meet Anna. And Simeon is described as a devout, richest, richest, righteous man. And um, he, he has been waiting for the consolation of Israel, for the consolation, the comfort of Israel. He's been waiting on the Messiah. And he sees Jesus and he, he knows that what he's been waiting for has come. It's hope in the hopelessness. This hopelessness, this waiting that Simeon and Anna would have been a part of for generations before them until now. God has been on a rescue plan and Jesus is the final piece. And Simeon recognizes that. And Anna has been living in the temple. She's older, which would makes us believe that she was wise and respected. And she too had been waiting waiting on the Messiah, waiting on the salvation. And the responses are fascinating because Simeon takes Jesus in his arms and he praises God. And Anna, she gives thanks. She worships God. And she shares the news with others. Hope in the midst of hopelessness. Peace in the midst of chaos, light in the midst of night. 
and the word in the midst of silence of a really long time. This is our God who comes to be with us through Jesus Christ. This is the good news of Jesus Christ. And this is just the beginning. One of the things, as I've been studying in Luke 2, 21 through 40, there's this question that keeps coming up for me. And it's, what will we do with Christmas? I don't know when you'll watch this video. It could be on Christmas Day. It could be on December 26th or January 1 or January 21st or March, whenever it is. The question we need to ask ourselves is what do we do? What do we do with this God who broke through at Christmas? What do we do with Christmas? Do we pack it up on the 26th of December and put it away until next year? No. We live this out. We live out the word and the light and the, the peace. We live that out. We live that out in our lives. The hope, the miracles, the possible that seemed impossible. We live that out day in and day out because we believe and we follow a living God. He's not dead. It's very much alive. We need to live into that, not pack that away, not go, God, that's over. Whew, holidays are exhausting. Our God isn't exhausting. Our God is peace-filled, hope-filled, light in the darkness, dwelling among us, peace that passes all understanding. That, my friends, is the God who broke through at Christmas. As far as next steps, um, this is a conclusion of this, this study. If you are following in real time, we will start a study at the very beginning of February 2022. I will be getting more information out about that, what that study is, and that will lead us up to Lent, and then we'll have a Lent study. If you are watching this video in the days, weeks following that, if you'll just reach out to me or, and or Keep um, checking in on our YouTube page in adult studies. We will continue to have classes, new classes offered through, um, through that in the months to come. Let us pray. Oh Lord, thank you. Thank you that you broke through at Christmas. Thank you that you breaking through at Christmas is not just an event that we remember from a long time ago. It is a life-changing, life-transforming God, that's who you are. May we live in that every day. May we live in the truth that you came to be with us, dwelling among us, that you are light in the darkness, that you make the po impossible possible, that you are peace in the midst of our chaos that passes all understanding, that you come in the chaos and you provide us peace and that you are hope in the midst of our hopelessness. We thank you into your hands. May our will, may your will, not our will be done. Amen. Thank you for joining us. Uh, if if I, I wish you a Merry Christmas, whenever you're getting this, because we're not packing Christmas up. Merry Christmas, may God be with you and may you know that you are loved by a mighty God. Go in peace, amen.